God used to dwell in a house among his people. But now he has a home that's better than the first. It doesn't look like a building with a steeple. Now he's living in the people of the church. Brick after brick, God is building his temple. Brick after brick, he's making it strong. With Christ the sure foundation and his people as the stones, he is building a place he can live. Brick after brick. Well, good morning, church. We are thankful to be here this morning on this special Sunday. I'd like to share a thought with you this morning. We're going to be taking our assignment from the Gospel of John, the 12th chapter. And I'm reading today from the New International Version. Beginning at verse 12, find these words. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Jesus found the young donkey and sat on it as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. I want to move to the 19th chapter verse 5 when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe Pilate said to them here is the man as soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him they shouted crucify crucify but Pilate answered you take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. Chapter 12, they took palm branches and went out to meet him shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Chapter 19, When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, crucify, crucify. I want to talk this morning from the subject from palms to thorns, from palms to to thorns. So here we are again, what has become a tradition for the churches and the world, we call it and recognize it as Palm Sunday. It is the time when Jerusalem and Israel, Jews and Gentiles, collectively recognize Jesus as the Messiah, as the King that they've been waiting for. It's not the first time the crowds recognized him as king, but it is the first and only time that Jesus presented himself as the king. The event here was recorded in the prophecy, Zechariah, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph. People of Jerusalem, look, your king is coming to you. 
He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. And it has been said, and you've heard us expound on this before, the role of the donkey. Many people have said that this was showing how Jesus was humble because he didn't come in riding on a horse, but rather a donkey. And it is assumed that if you ride a donkey, there's nothing really impressive about it. It's assumed that donkeys are for unimportant people, for peasants. They're not very impressive. But you notice no one there is discouraged that Jesus is riding a donkey. No one from the crowd is saying, well, wait a minute, do we have this wrong? After all, he's riding a donkey. And it's because we don't see donkeys as being very impressive. I mean, just in the appearance. Horses have this majestic air to them. Look strong and mighty. They're large as opposed to a donkey who maybe is not so impressive. It's sort of like when you see somebody pulling up in a big fancy car, a Cadillac, a limousine. It goes to this person must be really special, must be important. When you see somebody just pull up at anything, <laughs> it's like can't be that important. He can't be that significant. But as you've heard us talk before, donkeys kind of get a bad rap because donkeys were very expensive creatures. The property of rich people, royal people, significant people. The old story of the judges. One of the judges is noted after Tola died, Jair from Gilead judged Israel for 22 years. Well, what was his contribution? His 30 sons rode around on 30 donkeys, and they owned 30 towns in the land of Gilead, which are still called the towns of Jair. What was Jair's contribution? What did he bring to the table? Money. He was rich. He owned a lot of property. And proof and evidence of his wealth was he owned 30 donkeys. And so donkeys belong to rich people, royalty, important people, significant people. You will note that Jesus did not own a donkey. He had to borrow one for this occasion. Go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say the Lord needs it. Jesus is not humble because he's riding a donkey. Jesus is humble in spite of riding a donkey. Because, you know, there's some folks you can't give them nice things. Some folks can't handle money because it becomes all about them. So the idea that kings rode horses, not donkeys, Leaders rode horses, not donkeys. Well, 
Kings rode both donkeys and horses. We find that in the Old Testament. The king, David, also said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule and take him down to get home. There let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel and blow the horn and say, long live King Solomon. So kings did ride donkeys and kings rode horses. The difference is when a king rode a horse, it was for war. Even in Revelation, it speaks about Jesus. I saw heaven standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and wages war. On his robe and on his thigh, he had this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So kings rode horses when doing battle. Kings rode horses when they were going to war. But kings rode donkeys when they were coming in peace. Now, as we said, this is not the first time that the crowds were ready to make Jesus a king. We find a similar occasion mentioned in all four Gospels of the feeding of the 5,000. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Now, there's some interesting language here. They were ready to force him to be king. It doesn't say they were hoping that he would be their king. They were desiring him to be king. They were going to force him to be king. And this would seem to suggest that they wanted him to be king as long as he met their expectations. Jesus, you pull a big crowd and you got some good miracles in your pocket. And we're ready to make you the leader of the pack here. We're ready to anoint you as king. But we're going to want some things from you. And that was their attitude. And we have attitudes like that today. We want you to be a leader. As long as you do the things that we're looking for. We want you to be the pastor, but there's some things we're going to want to see you do around here. I guess I better stop now. (laughs) Some people who want something for you often just want something from you. And so they were ready to have him as king provided He met their expectations, provided he accomplished their demands. Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust him. But Jesus didn't trust them because he knew all about people. No one needed to tell him about human nature for he knew what was in each person's heart. God's plans do not require man's recognition. 
God's purpose does not require man's endorsement. So Jesus didn't run after the title, even though they were ready to put it on him. So Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you cannot have eternal life within you. This is what Jesus was bringing to the table. This is what Jesus was bringing to the discussion. You want me as king? This is how it needs to go down. From that response, many of his disciples said, this is very hard to understand. How can anyone accept it? At this point, many of his disciples turned away and deserted him. We want you to be king because of what you're doing for us, what you're providing for us. And in a matter of hours, maybe less, the tides turn and the crowd, the same crowd that was ready to make him king says, I'm out of here. Some are grateful for what God does, but don't love God for who he is. And now we see the same thing happening on that Palm Sunday. Very similar circumstances. This time, the Gospel of John tells us why Palm Sunday came about. It went around yet another miracle that Jesus did. The raising of Lazarus. We find that in the 12th chapter. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. For it was because of him, Lazarus, that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard about this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Some Greeks who had come to Jerusalem for the Passover celebration paid a visit to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. They said, sir, we want to meet Jesus. Philip told Andrew about it, and they went together to ask Jesus. Jesus replied, now the time has come for the Son of Man to enter into his glory. And you could see them sitting up in their seats. Okay, now we're talking. We're talking glory. This is it. It's going to happen. I tell you the truth. Unless a kernel of wheat is planted in the soil and dies, it remains alone. But its death will produce many new kernels a plentiful harvest of new lives. Those who love their life in this world will lose it. Those who care nothing for their lives in this world will keep it for eternity. Anyone who wants to serve me must follow me because my servants must be where I am and the Father will honor anyone who serves me. That wasn't what they were expecting to hear. That didn't sound like glory. Now you're talking about dying, going into the ground, and everyone who comes after you needs to follow in that way. So now once again, 
the crowd becomes unimpressed. And that brings us to this Palm Sunday. Ready to make him king, and within five days, they're calling for his death, for his execution. Now, in our text, it says, when Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, here is the man. It's interesting that Jesus is crowned with thorns. First time we read about thorns, we have to go back to Genesis. After the fall, then to Adam, he said, because you have heeded the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree, which I commanded you saying you shall not eat of it, cursed is the ground for your sake. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles, it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the herb of the field. Thorns was a product of the curse. Thorns was never part of the original creation. There were no thorns in the Garden of Eden. Roses didn't have thorns. Thorns on them. Thorns came about from the curse. Thorns was the result and the product of sin. And so every time they would have to deal with thorns, it would serve as a reminder. You did this. You messed this up. This is from your sin. Thorns are the product of a curse. And Jesus is now crowned with thorns. There's another story that involves some thorns. And another familiar story of Abraham's sacrificing of Isaac, which in itself is a prophetic picture. In Genesis 22. Abraham ventures out with his son. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them, together. And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And I like the way this translation phrases this. Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them, together. The language that God will be that lamb. God will provide. And as the story unfolds, we know he sees this scene. A ram in the bush. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked. And behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering Instead of his son. Here even this. The imagery. Of a ram. Caught in thorns. Perhaps picturing. Our king crowned. With thorns. Thorns that was a result of. The curse. Of sin. Christ has redeemed us. From the curse of of the law having become a curse for us as it is written cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree Palm Sunday prepares us for that Jesus taking on the curse 
Here on this day, they're ready to accept him as king. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And yet, in a matter of days, in less than five days, they're ready to kill him and crying for his death. When Jesus gave them what they wanted, They gave him palms. But when Jesus gave them what they needed, they gave him thorns. What is our attitude in this season? We all refer and think about God's love as unconditional. God loves us unconditionally. He loves us no matter what we've done. He loves us no matter where we've come from. No matter who we are, you come to Jesus, he'll never turn you away. He'll never say, you are too far gone for me to do anything with. That's called unconditional love. And we all know that God loves us unconditionally. But a better question Can we love God unconditionally? Or do we just love God when he's doing things for us? Can we love God when he says no? Can we love God when he doesn't heal you? When he doesn't deliver you from your troubles? Oh, hallelujah. Palm Sunday is a time for us to check ourselves to see whether or not we aren't ready to trade in palms for thorns. That we can love God no matter what our circumstances. And so today we hail him king. And I hail him king because he saved my soul. But he's still king even if he doesn't do what I'm looking for him to do. He's still king even if I don't have the money that I want. He's still king if I'm still sick in my body. God is still my king even when I don't get what I want. He's still king when my friends turn their backs on me. He's still king when I come up against the wall and I don't know which way to turn. He's still king when I'm discouraged and I feel like giving up. I'll still lift up palms and say hail to Jesus. Hallelujah. Come what may, no matter what happens, no matter where I come from, no matter what's going on around me, he's still my king and I'll praise him in the good times. I'll praise him in the bad times. I'll praise him when I'm down and out. I'll praise him when I'm sick in my body. I'll praise him when the money runs out. Hail to my king. Hail to my my king, hail to my king. Ooh.